I think it was Chesterton who said that, uh, commented that um, the reason that fact is often stranger than fiction is that fiction is what we invent with the human mind, and therefore it's more amenable to human minds. Sometimes facts, which we are not responsible for, are so startling that they're much harder to believe. Can you think of things that you've uh, unearthed in your life as a historian that have been so startling you wouldn't have believed them without a lot of evidence? Well, I, th I think that... Um I think that actually the border between fact and fiction is much more nebulous than, than people might think. And that's, I mean, we see that very, very clearly with what's going on at the moment in Ukraine, that there are rival versions of what both sides are claiming is to be true. So in a sense, both sides are, are telling stories. And obviously we have to decide, you know, it, it, it's up to us as concerned citizens, uh, as politicians, in the long run as historians, to decide which approximates better to reality. And yet there is always a sense, I think, that um, reality is clothed in kind of narrative and in fiction mm. to, to that extent. And the further back in time you go, the truer that is. Mm. So the periods of history that I've always been particularly interested in, the sources, for say, for ancient Greece or for ancient Rome, are often they're already shaped in kind of, not exactly fictional ways, but they're, they're not exactly documentary evidence either. So there's always been that, I, I've always been interested in the way in which um, the, the borderlines between fact and fiction are contested and can bleed into one another. Now, I, I'm aware that I, ha I have kind of evaded your question there with some kind of philosophical nebulousness. But I, so there, I will give you an example of um, a story that did, I read it, I came across it, and I thought this cannot possibly be true. Uh, and it was while I was researching Dominion, uh, mm. and I was looking, uh, I wanted to write about medieval heresy. So I was reading a lot about medieval heresy, and I wanted something that touched on um, the, the attitude of the church to, uh, to, to women, uh, and I came across this story that in 1300, in um, uh, an abbey outside Milan, the Inquisition moved in and they dug up the grave of a woman called Guglielma and they exhumed her and they burned her remains. And this woman, Guglielma, had been supposedly of Hungarian royal stock. It was also rumoured that she ha had some kind of relationship to the royal family in England. And she had then come to Milan and had lived a life of, of seemingly um, spotless purity and holiness. And as a result, following her death, her shrine, her tomb had become a kind of focus of pilgrimage. But what the Inquisition claimed was that um, her grave, her tomb, had been, become the focus for an absolutely shocking heresy, namely the claim by um, the woman who uh, was in charge of the, the abbey, a woman called Mafreda, who was um, the, uh, the cousin of the tyrant of Milan, that um, Guglielma had actually been the incarnation of the Holy Spirit and that her coming um, had served to bring in a new age of the world. So there'd been the age of the Father and then the coming of Christ had ushered in the, the, the age of the Son and now Guglielma's coming had ushered in the age of the Spirit. And this was going to be an age in which the Pope and all the Cardinals would be women. And it was an age, w just as the age of the Son had been a masculine age, this was going to be a feminine age. Um, and I thought, that can't be true. <laughs> I mean, that's such an astonishing story. And I read it, and it, it was indeed true. But I realised one of the reasons why it seemed to me so fictional was that it had the cast of an Umberto Eco story. So it, it was like The Name of the Rose. It was like something that Umberto Eco would have written. And of course, Umberto Eco, you know, he lived in, in, in Milan. He was a specialist in the subject of medieval heresy. Of course he knew about it. And of course, it must have fed into his fiction and into the way that he kind of, you know, mediated history and transformed it into fiction. So that absolutely sums up for me the kind of the, the fascination that I find in the relationship of history to fiction. I, I, I think it's... It's, it's, it, it's almost, um, you shouldn't try and fight against the, the, the implication that, um, that history can generate fiction, that fiction can then kind of slant and perhaps distort and frame one's understanding of history. That relationship, I think, is, is absolutely impossible to disentangle.